Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. All right, so I just want to apologize a little bit for my voice. I am still a little bit sick, but I wanted to get this episode out to all of you. So here I am. Welcome to November, my friends. So what does November remind you of? For me, it's Thanksgiving. (laughs) Yum. I love me some sweet potato casserole and some baked ham and some turkey, of course. But listen, November is known for something else in the military. The United States Marine Corps birthday. (laughs) That's right. And that's usually accompanied with a big, giant Marine Corps ball. And if you know the Marines, they do it big. On this show, I am constantly covering army cases, but today I am turning my sights on the Marines. And oh, what a tragic story I have for you today. This episode does contain graphic depictions of brutal murder and a crime involving sexual violence. So listener discretion is advised. I also wanna give another disclaimer, a disclaimer that's not very common. This case contains discussions of racial discrimination in the workplace. This conversation may involve one person feeling that someone is racist, while other minorities in the workplace do not feel the same way. If this is not a topic in which you can partake in with an open mind, maybe try skipping this episode. And if you feel the need to listen and you don't agree with what was said, understand one thing. I am only relaying history. Join me today as I bring you the story of Lieutenant James Lotz and his wife, Joan. Now, let's dig in. This story was researched and written in collaboration with one of our very own listeners and fan club members, Myrtle. The case I'm discussing today has a butchered court history. And with that, I rely heavily on court opinions, specifically military appellate court opinions from the Navy Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals and the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. Additional sources include articles in the Washington Post, the Times Tribune, AP News, and a 2002 version of Marines and the Military Law. In her research, Myrtle also dug up a few posts from the National Organization of Parents of Murdered Children and a call for parole submissions from a Facebook page. If you're interested in watching some of the court arguments that took place throughout the 90s, C-SPAN has a few available on their website, and I'm going to link to it in the show notes. Now, this story takes us all the way back to the 80s. In January 1985, a 19-year-old Marine named Ronnie A. Curtis, originally from Wichita, Kansas, reported to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Here we go again. More North Carolina cases. I, like, can't get away from it. Ronnie was the newest member of 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines, 2nd Marine Division, where he was assigned as a supply administrative clerk. Since he was single, he was assigned to the barracks and he had a roommate. Ronnie Curtis didn't come from the best of homes. At the age of two, he was adopted. But reports indicated that Ronnie's new home was far from the loving home that you expect to be adopted into. Ronnie's adoptive father was both physically and verbally abusive. He often called him names. He whipped him with a horse whip. I mean, like many, Ronnie dreamt of getting away from all of this. And he did when he ran away to the Marines. Maybe this would be the place where he would finally feel accepted. The officer in charge of Curtis's section was 26-year-old First Lieutenant James F. Lotz, and this was the battalion supply officer. Lieutenant Lotz lived on base on Camp Lejeune with his wife, Joan, who was also 26. Ronnie and Curtis, they worked together for the better part of two years. But then Ronnie got himself into some trouble. On April 14, 1987, it was well after midnight. 
and 21-year-old Ronnie was drunk after spending the night drinking Mountain Dew and gin with his roommate. He was behind the wheel of a 1985 Red Ford Tempo, and he was heading from Camp Lejeune to Wilmington. But he was so tired and drunk that his eyes just kept closing, when little by little, he dozed off. He was awakened when the car that he was driving veered off into a ditch. Ugh, well, that will wake you. Nearby, a state patrolman saw the wreck, which thankfully was just a one-car accident. The cop asked Ronnie if he was okay, and Ronnie said yes, and he relayed that the car he was driving wasn't his own. It was actually his lieutenant's, Lieutenant Lotz. The patrolman asked, well, does he know his car was in a wreck? And Ronnie looked at him and he said, no, and he won't because he's dead. The officer looked confused. What in the world was Ronnie talking about? James Lotz and his wife grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And if you're wondering why Scranton sounds so familiar, it's because it's the setting for Steve Carell's hit TV show, The Office. So many people thought that Scranton was a made-up city for the show, but it isn't. It's a real place, and it's where James and Joan were from. According to reporting by Chris Kelly for the Times Tribune, James grew up on Gibbon Street. He graduated from Scranton Central High, and he obtained a business degree from the University of Scranton. Joan, well, she was a stunner. She was one of 12 kids born to Bill and Ann Rose Halpin. There were eight girls and four boys. And her father, Bill Halpin, he was an investigative reporter for the Scranton Times. According to reporting by Chris Kelly, Bill was a big deal. He helped expose a huge airline drug ring. He broke the news on heiress Patty Hearst's whereabouts. She was a fugitive, in case you were wondering. And he even interviewed a mob boss by the name of Russell Buffalino. And for those of you who are nosy like me, I had to Google it, right? So Buffalino was the mob boss of the Northeast Pennsylvania Mafia family. And he was head honcho for 30 years. But anyway, I digress. I guess that's for another case. Yes, Joan's dad was a badass. Joan grew up on North Irving Avenue and she graduated from Bishop Hannon. Is it Hannon or Hanan? I'm probably wrong. Um, high school. And she attended Lackawanna Junior College and East Stroudsburg University. She was an athlete, a singer and a musician. After college, she worked as a teacher and a basketball coach, and then she even worked for UPS. So she kind of did a whole bunch of stuff. Before leaving Scranton in 1985, Joan won the Coastal Plains 2A Basketball Conference Coach of the Year Award in Scranton. At Camp Lejeune, Joan was a high school teacher, and she was also a basketball coach. The lieutenant and his wife, they didn't have any kids, but they actually met a young man who was down on his luck when his parents up and left to Ohio. James and Joan, they welcomed this young man into their home, letting him stay there for about three months. And the young man even helped Joan coach the high school basketball team. So the young couple, they found themselves a little bit away from home in North Carolina. And as many of you know, military members, they tend to get close with the people they work with because that's the closest thing to family. The supply section at Camp Lejeune was no exception. The lieutenant and Ronnie Curtis, they worked together, as I mentioned earlier, for two years. During that time, the lieutenant and Joan, they would host tons of barbecues at their house on post. Curtis knew the Lotzes very well, and he was familiar with their house. Besides going to the Lotzes' house socially, sometimes he'd have to drop by the house for work-related issues. Now, there's always a risk in the military, right, of blurring the line between enlisted and officers. And just a quick side note for non-military listeners. Officer members and enlisted members are not allowed to fraternize outside of work with each other, meaning officers should not be hanging out with enlisted members on like a friend to friend basis. This rule actually acts as a way to ensure professionalism prevails in the workplace. You don't want there to be any issues of favoritism or anything like that among the ranks. But in this case, by all accounts, Lieutenant Lotz's open invitation to the gatherings at his house were allowable. Since no one was excluded, he let everyone come over. But still, interacting socially can cause over-familiarization, and it could actually cause the lines between professionalism and friendship to blur. Lieutenant Lotz appeared to have been kind of like a funny guy. 
He had nicknames for many of the Marines that worked for him, and he either made these names up himself or he used nicknames coined by others. According to an appellate court opinion, the lieutenant called a Marine who was Peruvian. He called him, quote, a fuzzy headed foreigner, end quote. He called some others Tomahawk, Red and Jonesy. He called a fellow Marine officer, quote, Action Jackson, end quote, apparently after some action movie. And Lotz had a few nicknames for Ronnie Curtis himself. He called him, quote, Bebop Curtis, quote, Shoobidoo, and, quote, Curtis Blow, end quote, in reference to a black rapper. So it should be noted for this story that Ronnie Curtis was black and Lieutenant Lotz and his wife were white. And now this will become important later on in our story. So Lieutenant Lotz allowed his Marines to play music while they worked, and it seemed that the popular choice was rap music. Well, when Lieutenant Lotz would walk through the area, it was reported that he was known to, quote, imitate what he thought to be black mannerisms, end quote. According to many Marines in the unit, Lieutenant Lotz's actions to him were meant to be funny or fun and playful. Many even describe Lotz's actions as joking and casual. Lotz used the nicknames in jest, and he didn't think anyone took offense to them. But unbeknownst to him, one of his Marines took offense, and it was Ronnie Curtis. He took great offense to it, and he perceived that Lieutenant Lotz was insensitive towards people of color. Quite honestly, Curtis thought Lotz was a racist. There were times when Lieutenant Lotz was trying to get Curtis's attention, and when he was unsuccessful, Lieutenant Lotz would actually snap his fingers at Curtis to get him to kind of like snap out of it and, you know, get with the program. Well, Curtis took offense to this finger snapping and the lieutenant's actions, they were making Curtis's blood boil. Curtis wasn't the only one who perceived the use of nicknames as negative, though. During an inspection of the supply section, Lieutenant Lotz was called out by a senior evaluator for using nicknames instead of properly using the Marine's rank and last name. And Lotz was told to knock it off. But after the inspection, instead of heeding the evaluator's suggestion to use proper names, the lieutenant did something else. He gathered all his Marines together and he asked them if the use of nicknames bothered them. Of course, none of the Marines at the meeting said that it bothered them, which, come on, duh. Any leader should know that no one is going to call them out in a public forum like that. So seeing no objection, Lotz assumed no one cared that he used these nicknames and he continued to speak to the Marines in a very casual manner. And well, it was business as usual. Now, as noted by the appellate court, this is a bad habit that a lot of young officers fall into when they allow and even promote an informal relationship with their subordinates. Often it's because they're trying to be accepted by the enlisted personnel, but according to the courts, It interferes with the good order and discipline that should exist between officers and their enlisted personnel. Monday, April 13th, 1987, started out like most Mondays. Lance Corporal Curtis reported to duty at the supply section at 0730, and that's 730 a.m., and he worked until 430 p.m. For one reason or another, Lieutenant Lotz was off that day and he wasn't in the office. After work, Curtis went back to the barracks and he hung out with his roommate. They were listening to music for a few hours and later that night they went and got a bottle of gin. They went back to their room and they tossed back mixed drinks. Their drink of choice was Mountain Dew and gin. They drank nearly the whole bottle and it's actually estimated that Curtis drank about a pint of it on his own. Later that night, Curtis decided he needed some fresh air and he went outside to take a walk. He was all by himself. He was alone. On his walk, he chugged Mountain Dew and gin from his canteen. And as he walked, he felt like he couldn't get work out of his head. You know when that little thing just plays in your head over and over and over again. But he wasn't actually stressing about work. He was stewing over his perceived treatment by Lieutenant Lotz. He kept thinking to himself, who the hell does he think he is calling me names and snapping his fingers at me? And every time that Lotz called him a nickname, Curtis envisioned his father calling him names when he was younger, and this further fueled his anger in this moment. Curtis walked and walked and walked until he found himself in front of the supply building where he had worked for two years. 
And in that moment, as he stared at the building, he came to a terrible, a terrible and irrational conclusion. Lieutenant Lotz had to die. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash Military Murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash Military Murder. HBO Max presents Love and Death. It is human nature to take risks. Would you be interested in having an affair? Starring Elizabeth Olsen and Jesse Plemons. You need to be careful. Betty Gore was murdered by someone she knew. The new Max original limited series, Love and Death, premiering April 27th on HBO Max. The truth has a way of coming out. Listen to the official Love and Death podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Curtis wasn't exactly sure how he was going to kill the lieutenant, but then he remembered that the supply building was stocked with K-Bar knives. Remember the Gainesville Ripper from episodes 81 and 82? Well, a Marine Corps K-Bar was the same type of knife that Danny Rowling used to carry out his vicious murders. K-Bar knives have a long history in the U.S. military, specifically the Marine Corps, going back over 100 years. Now, the K-Bar has a 7-inch double-edged blade, and it is deadly. Well, this would be Curtis's weapon of choice, but first he had to get his hands on one. So Curtis came up with a plan. Curtis broke into the vacant building through a window. Remember, it's nighttime now. And he proceeded to pick the padlock on the security gate. And that's when he helped himself to a knife. The entire time that he's doing this, remember, he was stewing over all of the ways he felt that Lotz had wronged him. And as he passed a computer on his way out, he like knocked it over. The court would later opine that Curtis did this because Lotz had implemented a new rule where people couldn't play computer games at work. And this really ticked Curtis off. Curtis then climbed back out the window and looked around to make sure no one saw him. He knew he would have to kill anyone that saw him there. It's at this point that Curtis believed in his mind that he had gone too far into the commission of this crime to go back now. But come on, you broke into a building and you stole a knife. Big whoop. It's really not as bad as murder, you know? Anyway, Curtis walked back to his barracks room to get a pair of gloves because every good criminal needs some gloves, right? I mean, talk about premeditation, though. And remember, that's going to be important for later. Back at his room, Curtis topped off his canteen with more Mountain Dew and gin. He was feeling, you know, kind of woozy and kind of lazy at this point. So he asked one of his buddies, Lance Corporal Moore, if he could borrow his car. Mind you, Curtis is wasted and his friend sternly told him, uh, no way, Jose. Well, disgruntled, Curtis left the barracks, but not before stealing a bike from a bike rack. The lieutenant's house was a mile and a half away, 
and he just didn't want to put in that type of work by walking or running or whatever. While on the bike ride to the Lotzes, Curtis again thought to himself, dang, am I really going to do this? But he told himself that he had come too far to turn back now. Sometime after midnight, Curtis arrived at the Lotzes' house. He realized that he needed a good reason for the Lotzes to let him in at this hour. So he came up with a ruse. He stashed the bike in the backyard, hid the knife in his waistband, and he walked around the house, basically casing it to see if anyone else was there. He went to the front door and he knocked. He waited. And within a couple of minutes, Lieutenant Lotz answered the door. Frantically, Curtis told him that he and a fellow Marine named Red from the supply section had been in a car accident and Red needed help. Lieutenant Lotz immediately opened the door and he let Curtis in. The lieutenant grabbed the phone and started to call the military police. But just as he picked up the phone and was distracted, Curtis struck. He pulled the K-bar from his waistband and he plunged the knife into Lieutenant Lotz's chest. Lotz tried to get away and managed to get a chair between himself and Curtis, yelling for his wife. Curtis made it around the chair and he stabbed him a second time. This time, he stabbed Lotz in the back, causing the lieutenant to collapse to the floor. Joan, at this point, she heard her husband, she heard the commotion, and she came rushing out of the bedroom wrapped in a blanket. She ran to her husband's side as she realized what was happening. She turned to Curtis, kicking at him with her bare feet, and she angrily shouted at him, asking what they had ever done to him. Now, Curtis then turned his rage to Joan, stabbing her seven times in the head, neck, and back. Joan pleaded for him to please, please, please stop, but he didn't. As Joan lay dying, Curtis grabbed her by the legs, tearing and cutting off her underwear. At this point, Curtis could see Lieutenant Lotz dying. The lieutenant was looking at Curtis as the light slowly faded from his eyes. According to reports, Curtis, fueled by complete madness, sexually molested Joan. While he did this, he looked at Lieutenant Lotz as he died and said, quote, You wanted a dog. You snapped your fingers. You called me names. You wanted a dog. Here's your dog right here. End quote. Next, Curtis, still drunk, searched the house looking for witnesses. He was intent on killing anyone in the house. Finding none, he wiped the knife clean and then rummaged around the Lotz's house until he found a set of car keys. He grabbed them and he grabbed a $5 bill in case he needed to go get gas. But before he left, according to reporting by Chris Kelly in the Times Tribune, Curtis actually made himself a sandwich and even watched TV. After he was done, Curtis jumped in the car. But after he got it started, he saw that it was a stick and he didn't know how to drive stick. So he went back inside the house. He checked on the Lotzes to ensure they were dead. Then he grabbed the other set of keys and took off in the other car. He drove around the base for a while, not really sure what he was going to do next. He hadn't even thought that far ahead. Eventually, he went over to the battalion duty office and he tried to trick the duty NCO out of his revolver. Yeah, okay, it didn't work. When that didn't work, he hit the road towards Wilmington, North Carolina, which was about an hour away. But this douche canoe wouldn't make it far because he was so flippin' drunk that he fell asleep at the wheel and crashed into a ditch. A North Carolina state trooper saw the wreck and assisted him out of the car and then took Curtis in under suspicion of driving under the influence. And it was during questioning about the DUI that Curtis confessed to killing the Lotzes. What the what? The trooper must have been so very confused. Now, I'm assuming from the details above that Curtis probably had blood on him, so it must have been evident something happened. Well, Seeing as Curtis was a Marine, the state police contacted Camp Lejeune's military police and turned Curtis over to them, where he provided yet another full and chilling confession. Lieutenant Lotz and his wife were soon discovered, and as already described, the crime scene was horrifying. Imagine all of the blood from stabbing someone over and over and over again. There must have been blood absolutely everywhere. With the full confession, Land Corporal Ronnie Curtis was charged for the double homicide, 
And because the violence was so gruesome, the government would be seeking the death penalty. In August of that same year, Curtis was tried at a general court-martial at Camp Lejeune. The military jury consisted of nine members, both officers and enlisted, and three jurors were black. At trial, the jury got to see crime scene pictures. And while I'm not 100% sure, I am sure they also heard about Curtis's confession. When it was the defense's turn, they argued that Curtis was also a victim because he endured systematic racial prejudice from the lieutenant. The defense harped, I mean, they harped on the name calling and the finger snapping, all which they argued led Curtis to feel demoralized. Five witnesses testified on Curtis's behalf. A staff sergeant that supervised him attested that he was as good of a Marine as they come. The base chaplain spoke on the deep remorse that Curtis felt following the murders. Mrs. Curtis, Ronnie Curtis's adopted mother, was called to testify as to Ronnie Curtis's character. She read 30 letters from people from his hometown that spoke to the high self-worth that Curtis had. His aunt and best friend also took the stand in his support, and all of them repeated the same things. They all testified that Curtis was a good person. He attended church, he played the organ, and he sang in the choir. The prosecution, however, painted a different picture. They argued that Curtis was a substandard Marine. Some of Curtis's co-workers gave testimony that he was a slow worker and sometimes lazy. They also said that while Lieutenant Lotz was tough on him, they recognized that Lieutenant Lotz, he actually made Ronnie Curtis a better Marine. Two black sergeants and a black staff sergeant that worked in the supply section, they testified that they did not think that Lieutenant Lotz was prejudiced or racist. They did not perceive any racial tension in the office, and they all agreed that the nicknames that the lieutenant used and the impressions he made were not done in a derogatory manner towards their race. The company first sergeant, who was also black, he testified that in 25 years in the Marine Corps, he had for sure seen racial prejudice and experienced it, but definitely not from Lieutenant Lotz. The first sergeant testified that he knew the lieutenant for two years and said in his testimony that there was no question in his mind that Lieutenant Lotz was not prejudiced. And remember the young man I mentioned earlier, the one who lived with the Lotzes for a bit? Well, he attested that they took him in and treated him like a son. And he was also black. It is reported that during the court testimony, Curtis appeared to have this look of disdain as folks testified for the government. And he showed absolutely zero remorse for taking two lives. After it was all said and done, Lance Corporal Ronnie Curtis was convicted of two counts of premeditated murder. He was also convicted of larceny, burglary, and two counts of unlawful entry. Because remember, he went into the house the first time when he killed the Lotzes, and then a second time when he exchanged the car keys. Continuing with the charges, he was also found guilty of indecent assault and he was convicted of damage of government property. Before we get to the sentencing portion of the trial, let's talk briefly about the death penalty and how it relates to military courts. The death penalty was enacted via the Uniform Code of Military Justice, commonly referred to as the UCMJ, and it was enacted back in 1950. In 1983, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces removed capital punishment in the military, determining that the procedures were unconstitutional when it came to sentencing in capital cases because there were no set guidelines. It was practically no man's land territory. However, the death penalty was eventually reinstated the following year when President Reagan signed an executive order with detailed rules and guidelines for capital court martials. Well, Curtis's trial in 1987 was going to be the first go at a capital case since the death penalty was reinstated by President Reagan. So all eyes were on this trial. As reported in the Washington Post, 
After the sentencing hearing, the jurors took only 78 minutes to return a sentence. Death penalty. (laughs) Wow. Listen to that again. It took nine people just 78 minutes to unanimously decide that Lance Corporal Ronnie Curtis was to receive the death penalty. I mean, I've taken longer lunches than that, to be honest. And to top it off, this was a record time from murder to sentence, from like the commission of the murder to when the guy was sentenced. As reported by the Washington Post, the entire process from the date that the Lotzes were murdered in April to the date that Curtis was sentenced in August, it was only 115 days. Well, that was all she wrote, right? I mean, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Now, while most of us would prefer justice to move this quickly all the time, the swiftness of this case begged the question, was this justice served or was this a miscarriage of justice? And it wouldn't be long until we would hear arguments on both sides of this case, because with death penalty cases, there are appeals up the wazoo, which there should be, right? You never want to get it wrong, especially not in a death penalty case. After trial, Curtis was escorted to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas to serve out his sentence and continue his appeals. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the death penalty for just a minute. It is an extremely divisive subject, and not every state has the death penalty. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, capital punishment is authorized in 27 states, the federal government, and the U.S. military. And some trivia for you, Do you know which state was the most recent one to abolish the death penalty? Virginia. Virginia was the most recent state to abolish the death penalty just this year in 2021. Not surprisingly, the states that have removed the death penalty have replaced it with life in prison without the possibility of parole, or as it's affectionately known around the true crime community, LWOP. And for the states that still have the death penalty, They primarily use lethal injection to execute inmates, except for South Carolina. South Carolina still uses the electric chair as the primary method of execution. Yikes. Okay, Arizona, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Utah, they authorize a secondary execution method, but only if you were sentenced before the lethal injection was made legal. In Alabama, California, Florida, Missouri, and Washington state, you can request an alternate method regardless of the date of sentencing. Now, your choices in these, quote, alternate execution states, end quote, are the electric chair, lethal gas, hanging, nitrogen, hypoxia, and are you ready for this? Firing squad. What? That's, that's crazy to me. I don't know. And for those of you curious about the military, our death row inmates probably have nothing to worry about because The last military member to be executed was in 1961 when an army private named John Bennett was put to death by hanging for the rape and attempted murder of an 11-year-old girl. And according to a 2002 publication of Marines and the Law in Vietnam, Trial by Fire, the last Marine to be put to death was in 1817. The Marine was William Boyington and he was executed by a firing squad. His offense is unrecorded. However, back then, the death penalty could be imposed for mutiny, desertion, or murder. All right, back to Curtis. Curtis had been sentenced to death, but it's not so cut and dry, right? There are checks and balances throughout the process to ensure that everyone gets a fair trial. In the military's case, the Court of Military Review, which is now called the Court of Criminal Appeals, reviewed Ronnie's case in 1989 and they affirmed the ruling by the original court-martial trial. Curtis went on to appeal his conviction four additional times over the next eight years, and he was represented by a Navy judge advocate by the name of Lieutenant Commander Mary T. Hall. Lieutenant Commander Hall went on to represent Curtis even after she retired from the Navy and entered private practice. Hall appealed on behalf of Curtis several times, but each of the appeals came back with the same decision. Denied. Verdict and death penalty were upheld. But in 1997, Ronnie Curtis's luck would change. 
In 1997, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, which is the military's highest court, they reconsidered Curtis's case after hearing it twice. And they determined that the original defense team had actually failed Curtis big time. They concluded that Curtis's trial defense attorneys focused exclusively on Lieutenant Lotz's perceived racism, arguing that it was this racism that caused Ronnie Curtis to retaliate. But the defense never once brought up Curtis's intoxication level as a mitigating circumstance. And during this appeal, the appellate court latched onto this. Curtis's blood alcohol level was tested seven hours after the murder, and it was sitting at 0.06. So Curtis's level of intoxication could have very well been introduced at trial. The government appellate attorneys screamed from the rooftop saying that this was not an error, but a trial defense attorney strategy. But regardless, Calf was not too fond of this defense decision. And even though they had already heard this case twice before, they decided to make a life-altering decision. And for those of you wondering what an expert would say about Ronnie's intoxication, well, I have an answer for you. During one of the appeals, a defense expert estimated that Curtis's blood alcohol content could have been as high as 2.26 at the time he committed the murders. Now, I don't know about you, but that is very high. In fact, before reading this case, I figured that 2.26 was practically a dead person. So what did Calf end up doing with this? Right? What did they do once they made this life-altering decision? Well, they upheld the conviction but in a three to two decision, they overturned the death sentence, primarily due to ineffective assistance of counsel. And they returned the case to the lower appellate court with two options. The first option was that the Navy Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals could order a new sentencing hearing or two, they could independently establish a new sentence of life in prison. At the time, a sentence of life in prison allowed for parole considerations starting at the 10-year mark. There was no LWAP. There was no life without the possibility of parole back then. And well, in 1999, the Navy Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals, in a 7-2-0, 7-2-0 decision, independently converted the sentence into life in prison rather than having a sentence rehearing. Now, this decision meant that Curtis was now eligible for parole only 12 years after brutally killing his supervising officer and his wife. But the Navy prosecutors, including the second highest ranking Navy attorney, they were pissed. I mean, that's my description, not theirs. They wanted an explanation. And the deputy staff judge advocate of the Navy actually asked CAF, the appellate court, to review Curtis's case again, specifically asking two questions. I know this is getting really legal, but it's so important. The first question was, does the lower appellate court actually have the authority to reassess sentences in capital cases? And the second question was, does it abuse its discretion by making its own sentence reassessment rather than ordering a rehearing? Well, the appellate court, CAF, they denied the request to consider the case again. That was the end. That was, that was the end of the road for the appeals. Now, you can imagine that in any death penalty case, tensions are going to run really high. There is a never-ending roller coaster of trials and appeals. And in the Curtis case, this brought to light various issues in, a, in the military justice system at the time. This case specifically, it highlighted the inexperience in the JAG Corps, Marine Corps in this case, in dealing with death penalty cases. But Curtis's sentence was not the only one overturned. In fact, by 1993, three other military death row inmates had their sentences set aside based on a deficient defense representation or incorrect sentence instructions. After Curtis's sentence was overturned, well, the Lotz family had a very emotional response. 
They thought their nightmare was over. They thought justice had been served. But turns out their nightmare continued. One of Joan Lotz's sisters, Grace Halpin, she was a police investigator in Scranton and she spoke out and she was quoted by the Washington Post as saying, quote, something is wrong here. We never thought Curtis would ever be eligible to walk the streets again, end quote. Along with the family's outrage at the reduced sentence, Marines at Camp Lejeune were also deeply affected. According to Bradley Graham, who wrote for the Washington Post, after the sentence was reduced, a senior Marine officer actually said, quote, there are Marines who would line up to shoot this guy, end quote. Now, every two years since his death sentence was reversed, Ronnie Curtis goes before the U.S. Parole Board. Every two years that Ronnie Curtis goes before the parole board, the Lotz and Halpin families have to relive that awful night in 1987. And in 2017, just days before the 30th anniversary of the brutal murders, Curtis was up for parole again. One of Joan's sisters, Mary Halpin Swift, she campaigned in the military and civilian communities for people to send in letters to the parole board requesting that Curtis's parole be denied. And on the day of the hearing, the hearing examiner would not make her decision until all of the letters and documents were read. During the hearing, Curtis was asked about the night that he killed First Lieutenant James Lotz and his wife, Joan. Mary Halpin Swift noted that even all of these years later, Curtis was very matter of fact with his response and noted that it was chilling and disturbing to hear. With that description of what happened, it's not surprising to learn that in 2017, Curtis's parole was denied and the clock was reset for two more years. Curtis's parole was again denied in 2019. And this past spring, in March of 2021, Curtis was up for parole yet again. Anne Halpin Slifer, another of Joan Lotz's sisters, she sent a letter to the Camp Lejeune High School alumni page on Facebook in February. And in it, she wrote, and I'm going to quote, it's a very long quote, so, so bear with me. Quote, Yesterday, I received an email from the U.S. Department of Justice. The next parole hearing date for Ronnie Curtis, murderer of my sister and brother-in-law, Joan and First Lieutenant James Lotz, has been scheduled for March 17th. This year's hearing is significant, as we were told at the hearing in 2019 that release may not be avoidable in the future due to time and completion of courses assigned to him. Joan and Jim were 28 years old when they were killed on April 14, 1987, in their home on Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, Marine Military Base. With all that our country has been through the last year, the thought of having this to deal with again is a bit overwhelming, Please know we want justice, not vengeance. Ronnie Curtis took their lives. He was judge, jury, and executioner. In his wake, he left a path of destruction that extended far beyond Jim and Joan. The lives of my family, parents, siblings, Joan and Jim's military and civilian friends and peers, and Joan's students have been grievously harmed. For many, while the destruction is deep, Emotional wounds are easily triggered and surface. Time alone does not heal. I cannot speak for others, but for myself, I have had to forgive our Curtis in order that I may live. That does not mean I believe he should be released. I adamantly do not. I am very fearful of him doing harm to others in the future, of him ever drinking again, losing control and killing innocent individuals. Please remember, Curtis arrived at their home around midnight after drinking an undetermined amount. He had stolen a bike, broke into the supply building on base where he and Jim worked, and he stole a K-bar knife. He knocked on their door and said his car broke down. Jim tried to phone for help for him, and as he did, Curtis stabbed him. Joan woke to Jim's screams and ran to see what was happening. At the last parole hearing, Curtis reminded us that Joan begged him to stop, even offered him the keys to their car to leave and get out. But he chose to stay and kill her and then molest her in front of Jim's dying eyes 
simply depraved. He then took their car and returned to the home to get the keys for a second one. He had an accident in the early dawn hours and their murders became known. In 1987, Curtis had accused Jim of racial bias as the reason for killing him. At the last hearing, he told us he had come to realize it was he who had harbored prejudice. He had difficulty accepting direction from any white person. Jim was Curtis's supervisor on base. Please help us once again. Time is extremely short. Please send an email directly to Portia L. Edwards, MS, by March 17th, 2021, at the contact information below. Thank you for any help you can provide. Sincerely, Anne Halpin Slifer. End quote. The 2021 parole hearing took place in Marion, Illinois Federal Prison. Anne Halpin Slifer and her husband attended in person with another Halpin sister, Bernadette, and her daughter, Abby. At least eight other family members and friends participated virtually from locations around the country, including Scranton, Pennsylvania, San Francisco, California, and Raleigh, North Carolina. After the hearing, everyone, everyone waited with bated breath. Would this monster be released? Would he walk among us again? A relieved Anne reported in the National Organization of Parents of Murdered Children's summer newsletter that parole had been once again denied and that the volumes of letters that had been sent in made a difference. They have already received notice of the next parole date, which will be in March of 2023, when they will relive the nightmare all over again. Every two years, these families have to fight to keep Curtis in prison, where they feel that he belongs for the rest of his life. And to add insult to injury, Anne was informed that each time they have a hearing, the only information relied on for the decision is what has been provided since the last hearing. Her plea for continued support from family and friends and the public, it endures. Ronnie Allen Curtis is now 56 years old. According to the Bureau of Prisons database, Curtis is currently being held at the Marion U.S. Prison. Joan Lotz's parents have since passed. Her dad, Bill, well, he died in 1992. Her mom, Anne Rose, died in 2013 after losing her battle to Alzheimer's. So while they're unable to fight for their daughter's killer to remain behind bars, rest assured that Joan Lotz's family will continue to attend the parole hearings. According to Chris Kelly's reporting for the Times Tribune, Tom Halpin, Joan's brother, has said about determination, we are, quote, determined to haunt her killer to his grave, end quote. Thank you all so very much for joining me this week. Again, I apologize for my voice, but I wanted to get this episode out. I tell these tragic stories every single week. I can't say that anybody would enjoy these stories, but if these are stories that you want to continue listening to, make sure that you subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to right now. And if you want to support the show, you can do so for free by leaving the show a five-star review wherever you listen. But just some ideas for listeners, Apple Podcasts takes reviews, and so does Facebook. So you can go to the Facebook page and leave a review there as well. Finally, I am now on TikTok. I mentioned that last time. So if you want to hear more true crime snippets, check me out there at Military Margot. Margot is spelled with a T at the end. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with all of my boot camp and hire Patreon fan club members. If you want to help support the show, Check out the Patreon today where you can access at least, at least 15 full length bonus episodes. And you can find that by visiting patreon.com slash military murder. This show's executive producers are Tina S, Ryan R, Alicia H, Falcon 13, and Nicole G. Our newest associate producers are Anita H and Sydney D. Our newest assistant producers are Kelly N, 
Alyssa R, Tanique L, Tiffany W, Nora U, Steph D, Jamilia, and Evelyn B. The music was created by Tie Ups. And I just want to give a shout out to all of our newest fan club members from October. In addition to our new producers, thank you and shout out to Jamie L, Daniel L, Marnita W, Travis S, Jenna A, Shervard R, Melanie, Danielle, BX Wanda, Elia F, Maida F, and Nina N. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Podcast.